Hello and welcome to another episode of The Code of Career with me, Cameron Blackwood. Today's guest is Tom Ryan. Tom has an amazing story. It took him a while to find his way into development and managed to work his way in after starting with another job at a company he was working at. He quickly rose up the ranks and went on to lead teams and be a successful contractor. Whilst Tom is still completing work for clients to this day, he's also combining that with a new academy, TechHerds. Tom will explain more about this later, but it's a new approach to learning. With both myself and Tom being career changers, this is a great opportunity to find out how two people stepped away from industries they were previously involved in to build a whole new career in technology and the strategies we used to do that and what we'd do differently as well. Before we do start though, I do just quickly want to mention the new Patreon page. I don't expect people to contribute if they don't want to, especially if they may be short on money and looking for a job. But if you do want to see some more behind the scenes and take part in the Code of Career as an active participant, then there are several options on there that are really exciting. These range from live streams to career coaching to secret Discord channels as well. If you want more information, please just send me a message and check out the links in the description. But for now, it's time to push those commits, grab a coffee and enjoy the show. Hey Tom, thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? I'm really good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, really great to have another one of the sort of tech top crew on. Uh, obviously, I had Code with Vincent on a few weeks ago, and that, that was really great. Um, but uh, someone else as well from from Team Europe on Tech Talk as well. Uh, so obviously, that's how we connected. Um, but if people aren't that familiar with you via uh, your TikTok or via any, any other channels um, that you work on, uh, do you want to uh, tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess I'm just another guy with a dev background who uh, wanted some f- fame. So I decided to start posting videos on TikTok. Uh, and I have a whole channel focused around how to get a career in technology. Primarily, it's kind of targeted at people who are not in technology yet. Um, and uh, I, I get a lot of criticism from people who are in technology saying technology is too broad a term. But um, I never know if I start talking about you know, become a front-end developer or become a PHP developer, JavaScript. I think, uh, I don't want to say it's alienating to people who um, are not in technology, but technology is a nice umbrella term to use for it. So, yeah, uh, if you want to get into technology, um, my TikToks will, will be a little nudge in the right direction, I think. Yeah, I, I really like all your TikToks. There's some really, really great advice in there. And I agree about the broad stroke side of things. Um, the code of career is actually somewhat of a misnomer. I, I actually as well really encourage people to go into other technical roles. Like um, I know you did a video on QA recently, which I really agreed with. Uh, also UI, UX design, product management. Like The thing is, there's so many, um, so many people that love the idea of getting into tech, maybe they're leaving school or university, um, but it just seems so intimidating to them. And if we can give them a bit of information, uh, just to show them that it's not actually too hard and almost everyone's faking it till they make it. Um, it can help with a bit of uh, the old confidence. Um, but yeah, plenty to talk about on there. But before we properly get going, um, I normally like to uh, sort of warm things up with a quick fire questions, if that sounds good to you. Go for it. Cool. And uh, so what, what was your first ever computer? Well, I, I didn't actually even get access to the internet until I was 17. So it's not oh, that... Wow. Yeah, I'm 31 now, so it's not actually that not that long ago. Um, it was one of those uh, Vista, uh, Microsoft. I can't remember the make, to be honest. But yeah, how how come until you were 17? Because that uh, you say you're 31 now, that must have been mid. That was 20, 2007. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, I I guess you could say I had old school parents who um, oh. thought <laughs> there was no real need to have internet and. Um, they didn't really do it in my, they didn't do anything computer related in my school. We did a CV once, that was it. Um, and yeah, so I basically, it was not until I left home uh, that I started regularly getting on the internet. Yeah, I uh, I got on the internet a little bit too early, really, like playing Age of Empires online at the age of like nine and being told I suck by teenagers in Germany, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe I should have stayed away for a little while. Um, and what, what about um, the in the actual tech industry itself? What's your favourite tech city? Tech city. Well, I mean, I think every, everyone's going to answer this a bit based on their own personal experiences. But I, had, I lived in Berlin um, about eight years ago, something like that. And at that time... Berlin, I mean, it's still a, like a major tech hub, startup hub, um, like 
in, in, if anything, its reputation has in, improved massively since then. But that was a really interesting time, I think, for it because it had kind of, for the previous 10 years, started really developing as this center of technology, um, especially on the startup scene. And it's really cheap, amazing nightlife, mega diverse, every kind of person you could meet. Um, uh, so I had a great time there without earning very much money. But you could, you know, there was the scope there to, to make a big career as well if you want. So my favorite is Berlin. It's, um, I'm, I'm looking at it from a little bit of a historical standpoint now that. Mm. Yeah, but Berlin is is super cool and a really interesting option and one of the best for uh, uh, in terms of salary versus cost of living in, in yeah. Europe, I find. And uh, yeah. uh, I, I recruited, I used to recruit there actually um, I, for a few a few different times when I was an external consultant. I recruited for the Berlin startup scene, and I also did a couple of contracts as an internal recruiter for a Berlin startup. And uh, yeah, it's very very cool market to recruit in, and um, yeah, I, I like the city. The, I mean, the, like, I think when you're young as well and you're not, you're on, you know, junior money, um, the cost of living is extremely important because it's going to affect what, you, I mean, your evenings and weekends are how you recharge for, you know, your day in work. So what you're able to do, even just simple thing like going for a beer and not being like, oh, I can't really afford to be, you know, in London, you're going to be paying five, six pounds anywhere central for a drink. Yeah, you know, it's not too much when you're older, but if you're only earning 20 grand, that, I mean, that's it. That's this yeah. significant amount of money. Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, to be honest, you know, that's a it's a factor of why I moved from London to Edinburgh. Uh, like, I mainly moved for like family and lifestyle reasons, but uh, yeah, it, it, it just uh, living in uh, like a London or a New York or a San Francisco, it, it's just expensive. It's brutal as an entry I don't, level. I don't think uh, Edinburgh is not cheap though either, is it? <laughs> Edinburgh is not that cheap, and people find it funny um, when I like talk about how cheap it is here um because edinburgh is scotland's london really like in terms of uh you know especially like i've got cousins living in glasgow and they laugh at like how much we have to pay like to live in edinburgh um by by comparison but uh yeah edinburgh feels like because i've spent the most of my life in london um it feels uh edinburgh feels really cheap but actually it it is actually still quite expensive i think (laughs) yeah well i had a similar experience i went up to manchester uh about five years ago or something from having lived here um it was funny everyone around like greater manchester used to go on about how expensive the rent was and everything i was up there thinking it like everything was on sale especially rent was i, I remember getting an apartment it was like i'm not going to say what it was but i mean it, it was less than half what i was paying for a room in in a house share in london yeah I think, uh, yeah, again, I I won't give out numbers, but um, me and my girlfriend are paying the same now for a two bed flat near the city centre than we were for a room and a house share. So it is it is pretty ridiculous, (laughs) the differences, um, really. Um, And uh, what what about when when you are working? um, What what music do you like to listen to while you you code or well, I suppose these days you're not coding as much. We'll get on to that later. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when I was coding, the main thing I tried to avoid was anything with lyrics because I just found it distracting. I started thinking what the words were. So, uh, I don't know, anything. Um, I guess that kind of only leaves kind of trance music and sort of electro- electronic music. But uh, it was always in that if, if I needed to get stuff done, there was definitely not going to be anything where there was singing going on in it. Lyrics, are, there, there's definitely something um, that causes it to, causes the brain to trip a little bit when you're trying to concentrate two different things like. I think I found that even back in school when I was revising for exams, it was just, yeah, yeah really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not going to work. Yeah. And what, what about when you work? Would you say you're an early bird or a night owl? Um, overall, I'm probably a night owl. I like getting up early in the mornings, but I tend to faff about way more. Like I'll go, up, I'll get my coffee and I'll wander around a bit. Like I can, last night I was working from, had my dinner and like by about half eight because I, I had some stuff I had to get done so from about half eight to half twelve last night I just worked solid I, I tend to be most productive at night time yeah that's uh it's definitely the trend with people that are technical on this podcast tend to go for the evening and uh when the recruiters come on uh they all tend to be morning uh people so it's an interesting contrast um I go well, against the grain a little bit maybe it depends what you're doing because like if you think about it if you're programming or writing any code, you, you kind of just need to be so zoned. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying if you're recruiting, you don't have to be zoned in, but it's a, it's a lot more of a kind of a back and forth interactive kind mm. of, um, of an exercise. 
Yeah, that's true. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is for both both uh, sets of people don't want to do anything in the middle of the day because <laughs> the recruiters are getting um, badgered all day with phone calls uh, yeah. and, and distractions and um, devs are getting slack pings all day. So we don't want to deal with that. Uh, right. So yeah, it just um, goes to show that maybe asynchronous meetings and that sort of thing in the future, but who knows? Who knows? Do you know, what, do you know what's a great one? Uh, sorry to that. I, I, for a quick fire, I'm giving too long answers, but there's an app, there's an app called, um, I mean, you can do it with anything, but I just have to use Volley for this. Uh, V-O-L-L-E-Y. And you can basically leave, you know, like a WhatsApp voice message. You can just, it's the same, but just you do a video message. I've been using that with people I've been working with recently. It's just, it, it, it is fundamentally asynchronous. And uh, it's, it's really good for that. You can have like a full-blown conversation with someone without booking any Zoom. And like, it's way better than just texting them. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that being a good sort of uh, halfway between solution. Yeah. Um, I'll try that out actually because that that sounds yeah. very cool. Because I uh, I was a bit curious about how it would actually work. Because obviously with texting it doesn't, but um, there is something about the face to face. But if you're able to do it asynchronously, yeah. then um, then I can see how you. I'm, I'm having, so, I'm having uh, twenty conversa- conversations a day on this thing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Without having to block out a huge bits of yeah, diary, I, I'd like, imagine. Well, so, I, I yeah. walk out out of the room or do whatever. Just quick quick response. Off I go. The only thing is with a video, you have to make sure you're presentable each day, which uh, <laughs> some people that are video off by default won't be no. fans of that. <laughs> and um, what what about before you became a coder? What what job did you want to do when you were a kid? Uh, well, when I was a young kid, I probably wanted to drive lorries and trucks just because like, that's what I saw grown men doing, like my, my, fam- like my family, my dad or whatever. Um, so that, that sort of evolved a bit. Well, I've done a lot of different, like I kind of always was interested in the building trade and I've worked in built in construction a lot when I was younger. So that was probably from being a child to even a teenager. That was sort of my initial um, inclination. Hmm, interesting. That's a very sensible job um, for uh, compared to a lot of the ones I get, which <laughs> tend to be uh, either musician or athlete or something. So, as it, you know, as a kid, you obviously had your head screwed on. I, just, I knew I wasn't that talented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you and me both uh, I think I, I knew deep down that I wasn't going to make it as a rugby player somehow uh, <laughs> um, and so, so obviously we talked a bit about how uh, you, you mentioned you worked some construction and that sort of thing so yeah. did you, you did you get into tech immediately after leaving school or how did that journey no so I did I did very briefly did a plumbing apprenticeship which I quit after about not, not long anyway then I ended up working in Lidl for like three years nearly, um, which it kind of coincided with this training program they were doing at the time. And then I did a six month course in, it was called computing. And uh, from there, then I ended up working, just, I, just to get any old job, um, I ended up in a call center that happened to have a very small web team, which were basically building the systems that the the call agents were using, call handlers were using. And I don't know, one night, I I, did, I, did, I guess I, I was doing pretty well in there because there was a sales element to the job as well. And uh, I think I had like best sales in there basically for a couple of, two or three months in a row. And on the back of that, I got talked to the office manager, mentioned that I'd done my computing thing. And it, they gave me a, they let me, they basically said, you can have two weeks in the in the systems development team. So I said, sweet. Let's do it. Um, that turned into about eight months, and uh, by the end of that, I could kind of I could basically put a website together. So that, that was sort of my journey into it, and then it was just job to job to job after that. That, that that's really cool, and I love that strategy of the internal move. That's one that um, has come up on the podcast a couple of times, and it's one of my favourite ones because it's the fact that you don't have to step out and uh, retrain. Because obviously, people talk about tuition, but uh which, which is which is expensive right but what people don't talk about is one the fact your living costs aren't going to go away when you're studying um and you know or, or retraining and thirdly the uh the opportunity cost of the fact that you could be going and earning money elsewhere like i i honed a lot of my skills by taking a contract where i recruited four days a week and i was a software engineering intern one day a week it's one of the best strategies so that's that's really good that's a really clever way to do it though because and, and on that point i mean that I don't know what what does the university cost in the UK these days? It's it's what eight. 
I paid 9K a year yeah. um, and I was a 2013 entry. So it cost me 27K. Yeah. If you do a master's, more like 32, but that, then you can borrow money for maintenance. If, that's if it's yeah. a three-year degree as well. So if it's a three-year yeah. degree, you're talking basically, best, I mean, I guess 36 grand. But like, even on top of that, yeah, like you say, you, you're going to have you're gonna have rent, you're going to have bills and you come out of it, you're not actually that hireable. Yeah, it, it, it's difficult because so many people go to university to actually stand out from the crowd it is really hard. And yeah. there is a real, I'm not, I personally, I, I wouldn't say to people, don't go to university. It's always a controversial topic. I wouldn't say don't go to university, but I would just say think so carefully I think, about whether you, yeah, whether the pro- you go. The problem is, I mean, this is like with any advice though, you need to know what someone's end goal is to, to even offer advice. So I think it's it's incorrect. I, I do this on TikTok a lot, but it's more to be provocative. But it is fundamentally incorrect to tell someone, no, university is a waste of time. You should never go. Because you say, who knows what the person is trying to achieve. But if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, and, and that goes a bit beyond just knowing roughly what career you'd want. It, it, uh, by knowing what you want to achieve, it's, it's having an idea of what the journey is on that, on that way. Well, that, how do you get your first job? What does your first job look like? What kind of money do you need on the way? Like, if you if you don't have that in your head and you don't have a clear sense of how other people are on the journey potentially through university that you're thinking of doing, you don't have a reasonably clear sense of how other people have done it, then absolutely university is a ridiculous idea. Uh, and, and I think the problem is, you know, if you're 17, 18, whatever the age is, and you're, you know, you're thinking of what to do next, then it's university time, if you like. Um... I mean, most people, and through no fault of their own, are not really in a position to know what to expect at the other end of it. And from, like, from that point of view, you're making this huge investment on a debt you cannot get out of. So now you can go bankrupt from, a, from you know, if you, you can't, if you go bankrupt, you still have your um, university debt at the end of it. So, I mean, not to be a bit extreme, but fundamentally, that's the definition of indentured servitude. Yeah, I... It's it's yeah. Um, debt. I mean, it's a uh, it's a strong way of wording, it, but it is true. I mean, it is tough, and you're also at the mercy of um, of inflation as well because RPI yeah. apparently could hit seven yeah. percent. So the band I'm in, without giving away my salary sure, yeah. on the podcast, and the fact I live in Scotland, which makes things even more complicated <laughs> because I went to an English university, yeah. my interest rate could be eleven and a half percent next year on uh and i originally borrowed i think thirty five thousand pounds so it, it's pretty brutal like it's tough to get out of that again like and this is like absolutely we don't want to go into exact numbers but just out of curiosity given scotland has the higher percentage of the higher threshold does that get deducted or or does would you be paying is it on the gross and you'd be paying whatever you'd be paying in the uk so in Scotland we have an extra bracket that like kicks in. Yeah, I, I, I think it I think it means that I technically would pay a little bit less than I would be down south on a student loan. Yeah. But my sort of marginal deduction yeah, is high is higher. So I think I think maybe I think maybe I earn about a hundred quid less yeah. living in Scotland. Yeah. Than I would in England, but then it gets a bit. Um, this is almost getting to politics now. Oh, yeah, but then yeah. I get, I get like free dental, like eye checks, like it's all. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit complicated. Yeah, no, of course, of course. But I do think like, um, I, and it's, this isn't it to get political, like, but I do think it's something people need to think about because too many people just like it's like there's a reason that people sell cars on uh, on the on the monthly price instead of the total price. Because it three three hundred a month or whatever you you know whatever you're going to spend, uh, it sounds a lot different to thirty grand up front, um, or it even sounds a lot different to get a thirty grand loan and just give us the cash. Then you know, I, and if if your reason for choosing university is largely based on a well, I don't really know how else to do it. That's that's just the wrong position to be starting from, and uh, it's not a, it's not a good enough excuse in my opinion to um, to put yourself into that kind of debt. Mm, yeah and it, it's definitely a lot of people go go in because they think it's the done thing to do like uh, i i was surrounded by people did that they just went off to uni because you know it's what their mum and dad expected of them uh and and all the rest of it and you know you go in you do a random degree like i nearly did russian in university i'm glad i didn't i did business at least that's like somewhat useful but like i mean it would have been great, cool to speak russian yeah. but like in the grand scheme of things 
wouldn't have helped me in my career. Like well, at all. I don't know, mate. You could have got all these uh, all these quality Russian devs, and you'd be the translator for them. Uh. That's a good point, actually. I didn't think about that. Um, I thought you. Were, I thought we were definitely going to strain politics. Yeah. I thought you were going to make a joke about the current <laughs> situation. Um, for li- for listeners, we're recording this at the end of January, and hopefully everything's okay. Uh, but uh... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm I'm so out of. Uh, I, I don't even watch the news, mate. I, I know there's something going on there. I, I I I wish everyone well. I hope nothing bad happens. I the news depresses me. I just can't watch it. Yeah, I yeah it. Oh God, it is just so depressing. I, I prefer to stick with my uh, stick with my JavaScript yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know see, see what's trending on Hacker News and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I support that. Yeah, and um, you, you talked about the transition from uh, going in from the call center work to to being the web developer of this company. Yeah. Um, how has the industry evolved since then, and how have you been able to roll the punches? Because, um. I'm sure you'll forgive me for this, but I did have a wee LinkedIn stalk of you. Yeah. Um, and I saw you you sort of rose through the ranks pretty quickly. How did you navigate that and learn the new technologies? So I think uh, it, it's worth pointing out, when I started, um, there was a significant difference in what being a front-end developer and a back-end developer meant, I would say, competency-wise, that you could be a bit... Um, you didn't have to be. You didn't really have to have that many skills to be a front end dev then. And um, and the reason I'm pointing that out is because within the space of four years from me starting, I, I would say it almost flipped where being the front end dev was arguably more difficult than being a back end dev. So that that was a major sh- transition that I, I kind of witnessed early on. And um, you know, I mean, and like just to like be a bit detail specific about that. I mean, if you think about it. Especially nowadays, your average website, it's not just HTML and CSS and a bit of jQuery. It, it's, it's often a whole JavaScript framework and everything that comes with that. And what you have to think then is, well, that's the client side. So there's a limit to what you can do on caching, especially for first-time page loads. There's um, quite a big package just being delivered over to begin with, where on the server, you can write quite lazy back-end code, quite lazy uh, API responses, API code for responses. And you just need a good caching system because the same query is getting hit all the time. So uh, from that perspective, I definitely think it's flipped. Um, That was a huge thing. Um, And I guess PHP in my time, uh, I mean, a lot of people still like to laugh at PHP as not being a proper programming language, but it's a lot more of a proper programming language than uh, back when it was PHP 4 and um, whatever I was using when it came out first, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, I'd say they're the main things. JavaScript is obviously the, it's not really the new kid on the block anymore. It's, it's all this little frameworks are. That it's got grandkids uh, running all around the place. But um, that, I mean, JavaScript is, is, uh, is what stood out to me. I, just to put one point on this, because this is something I noticed on TikTok, and you might as well. Because, like, and let's call it technology. Technology space is so broad that what you work in specifically can be a huge huge um, entity on its own, but ignore many of the nuances of other sectors. So, I mean, I, I am kind of coming at this from primarily a sort of a web-oriented, but not just web, kind of e-commerce-focused um, situation. Like, So, yeah, the, I, I do see this on TikTok. I'll make a comment about something or put a point out. And someone else about a really valid point that completely cuts down what I'm saying, but it is it, only applicable to their sector. So I'm sure there's other people who listen to this maybe who who are thinking, nah, it's, it's something else is far more remarkable than that. Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. There's, there's always the always the exceptions um, to the rule. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's it's interesting you recognize about like learning that learning a new stacks, everything is tough, especially on front end. Um, Cause I mainly do front end myself and it is uh, the, the back end engineers that I, I speak to are always joking about how quickly it evolves. So I guess for people that are listening and there'll be a lot of people that are listening uh, that are trying to decide whether they'd want to specialize in front end or back end yeah. um, front end, you really do have to get used to rolling the punches. Um, whereas I don't know if this is a fair comment to make back end. You usually have to write code that is going to last a very, very long time. Uh, and it has to be structurally stable, whereas front end, you know, it's more about learning uh, the, the the newest stuff. But I think I think an element of it then is, and th- this is where there's no one answer for everything. So like, if you're dealing with a system that's um, got to be highly available, got to uh, deal with huge, huge numbers, 
And on another point, maybe a system that's not dealing with massive numbers, but dealing with massive data sets, the, the kind of requirements of that code are very different. Um, I, I would say, like, if, if I was to give like, a blunt response to that, I do think nowadays uh, the front end is probably, there's, there's more to overcome, and you could be two years into it and everything changes, and you're like, oh, my God, well, I've just, I, I barely know what I'm doing at this stage now. They've got this whole other thing. So I, I, think, I think it's tough. I, 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 I still recommend to people, though, if I if they're if they're looking on a on a language to pick, I think JavaScript is a great one to look at because you know you can do it on the back end or on the front end, and especially if you're in the UK, um, there's a lot of JavaScript jobs, you know, whatever site front or back you want to look at, a lot of JavaScript jobs in fintech and in e-commerce as well as like plenty of other sectors. But I mean, there are two huge sectors in in England and in the UK more widely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think JavaScript is my default, what I tell people, you know, that uh, people say, what, what should I learn? I just say JavaScript these days because um, Python is great, um, but uh, I, I would say JavaScript for its versatility. Like you can then pick up something else um, because really solid JavaScript fundamentals, you can go in and, and sort of do a job quite literally uh, in, uh, in almost any tech, tech organization if you have solid JavaScript fundamentals. Yeah. No, I think, but also I think, you know, if you've got an eye on maybe what you do in the future, it's good to be in a language that's got quite a broad um, sector base. And uh, I think Python, that's the one thing that comes against it is you're not going to have quite the amount of variety of industries you can move into. Mm. Python tends to, uh, I, I've noticed that it more, it's moved more towards specialization of data, which is really interesting and a really fulfilling career. Um, but it, you have to be prepared to do that side of things, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to want to learn that. I mean, you, you mentioned PHP earlier as well and how that's evolved a little bit. Um, would you recommend PHP is still something people should consider or, or, uh, or, or are they better to adopt something, something else? No, I think, um, I think there's no simple answer to that. So my starting point would be pick any language you want. If you if you get to a reasonable level of it, you'll not only get a job, but you'll eventually get very well paid. So I think that applies to basically every language. Um, but one of the things, if you're a junior or if, you, if you're not even a junior, you're, you're just trying to learn, um, you, want, you want to have the widest, um, you know, throw the widest net possible out there to, to help you get a job. And you want to have as many options as possible. And I do think there's a, a little bit less on the PHP front than there was. Obviously, the vast majority of the websites in the world have a PHP backend on them somewhere. But I would, I'd say if you were to say websites created in the last two years, that percentage gets drastically smaller. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and I think it's a it's a useful one to know for sure. But I yeah, I was curious to see what you feel, uh, I was interested what what you see there for uh, for for if it's something that people should pick up immediately. But um, I guess as well, there's always the fundamentals. Like once you understand how to do a loop in one language, like obviously it's just a case of googling the syntax, right? Yeah, I, and like to be fair, um, object oriented programming is worth knowing in any language, and you can do that in PHP. Uh, more so now than in the past, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think fundamentally, if you if you've got if you've got heart, part way down the road on some language, don't change just because you've heard someone say no, this one's not the this one's not the one to be doing. If, if you know anything at all, compound that knowledge by just continuing on it, and you know, uh, reach out to people who are in the sector using it, and, and they'll be able to tell you exactly what to um, you know how, how to take your next steps on that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something I, I'd always encourage people to do as well. Is like, don't be afraid to just drop someone like a, a message asking their advice. Like people just find it flattering uh, invariably. Uh, and the worst thing that's going to happen is maybe you get ghosted. But, you know, that is what happened. <laughs> you know, sometimes it happens. Like, um, you know, I've had it. Uh, my favorite sort of genre of that has been um, back in my recruiter days when I'd message a candidate Um they've uh i can see that they've ignored a message from when i messaged them as a recruiter now we're talking about something else we just have that uncomfortable awkward message from five years ago on linkedin <laughs> at the top of the conversation um which has always been a funny one um but but yeah and um 
th- throughout your career, what would you say a typical day in life um, has been like for you as you progressed up to leadership? Um, well, I mean, it was very different as a day-to-day developer than it was in mm-hmm. leadership positions. So, I mean, on the day-to-day, I think uh, my a common, although I, I did pretty well. I mean, I got I got kind of quite relatively senior relatively quickly, but I always remember being conscious that it was like your. You, I mean, th- th- this is one. This is just what development is. But you, you've got a problem in front of you. You don't know how to figure it out. As soon as you do figure it out, there's no moment to kind of wallow in the in the joy of having figured it out. It's, it's the next bit of the problem that you're moving on to. And so there was I, I, a kind of a sense I always had was um, you're you're kind of forever not where you need to be um, in terms of getting through a piece of work. Like you, you've always got a problem. It's never like building something straightforward. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things that a bit like built. No, I don't want to compare it to bricklaying, but in a way, a bit like laying bricks. You kind of you're kind of one brick after the other. You're slowly building something up, and there's a kind of a like bricklaying is quite enjoyable. I, I don't know if I'd want to do it all day every day, but um, like it, it, there's some kind of a satisfaction to it, and, and coding is a bit like that in some ways. Um, but I mean, day to day was much like anyone. I'm getting. Back in those days, you'd go into the office. So I'd get into the office, slap my headphones on. Maybe I was a bit hungover, um, and look forward to lunch and <laughs> do the same thing for the rest of the day. Yeah, um, it's uh, pr- pretty. Uh, sounds pretty much like my day to day. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and um, we, we obviously. Um, I'm assuming your demographics are relatively similar to mine on TikTok because mine, I would say, skews to. Roughly, uh, I mean, they're mainly UK based. Um, their average, I would say, roughly about 19 from what I'm getting. So they tend to be pretty young people in the grand scheme of things. Um, some are even a bit younger than that, and they, they want to get into tech. And maybe they've even just stumbled across uh, my video and said, like, wow, I didn't know you could earn so much money in technology. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they, they, they want to, uh, they don't know that much about the industry, but um, they think it's interesting and they know it's well paid. Uh, what do you say to someone who um, the standard way I normally phrase this is a relative asks you, but in our case, a TikTok user asks you, how do I get into this? I'm interested, but I don't know how. So I, I'm a big fan of just getting in any way at all. So I, I, for example, if you're 18, whatever, and you know nothing, well, in order to become a web developer, because that, that's sort of maybe one of the, the more popular choices, um, you're either going to have to be able to afford to spend, you know, a certain amount of time, probably quite a long time, uh, not working and just like learning the skill. Not everyone can just not work for a while and, and do that. So in that scenario, you're going to have to spend your time um, in the evenings and on the weekends practicing and learning. So in my mind, the best step you can take is um, expedite how quickly at least you get into a technology team. And it, in my mind, uh, and this isn't to denigrate the job of being a QA, it's that entry-level QA positions are probably the easiest to achieve most quickly. Now, there's huge variations in in, in what QAs do. Te- they basically test the websites or test the code. Um, and what I'm really talking about here is being a manual tester. I'm not talking about automation. I'm not talking about particularly API-driven stuff or anything like that. But at least if you get in, uh, if you pick a role like that, I mean, all you really need to do is worth having a basic understanding. And what I'm talking about here is like W3 schools level understanding of HTML, CSS, a bit of JavaScript, just to know like if there's an error in the console, be a little bit like, uh, just be a little bit informed about what, what you're testing. But at the end of the day, I think once you, I don't think it takes that much to be good enough to do a job like that at the early levels. And at least then you're in a technology setting, you're seeing developers, you're seeing what the environment looks like and spend your evenings rather than like, I mean, let's say you work on a building site or let's say you work in a shop, whatever it is, rather than spending a year or maybe longer trying to, in your evenings, and you, know, you won't be that consistent anyway because you'll be tired sometimes or whatever, rather than spending ages trying to learn web development, which is a lot harder to get into and takes longer and still working in, in that job you don't want to be in, well, Go f- first, go for the job that's easiest to get so you can minimize that time. And not only then do you do your learning in the evening, but you've got some advice when you're in work. You're getting noticed by your boss. They may give you a... I, I saw a QA, a manual tester years ago in a company I worked with. 
who he didn't even do any uh, anything in the evenings, and he just asked, could he become a junior so- uh, front end dev? And, and they let him do it. Um, you know, you so get getting getting your foot in the door. It doesn't matter what um, what level at all. Just get in there is is the priority. Yeah, jam that foot in because it is. If you can get in in the in in the lower rungs, um, doing what you know, just doing something, and then just just prove yourself with a bit of enthusiasm. And um, a lot of the time, it's a pain to recruit junior software engineers. It's a pain because um, you have to sift through a load of CVs. If someone's ambitious and comes to you internally and says, "Yeah, I want to do this," like I've seen it happen multiple times where someone's come from even a completely non-technical. Uh, I mean, I guess it happened to me uh, from a non totally non-technical and uh, steps into software into a junior software engineering role. Um, it's happy days around because no, you don't have to pay a recruiter. Uh, you're helping someone out internally. Like it's a it's a it's a great way and um, it's such a, such a good way to get stuck in. Hundred percent. And you know, I think uh, kind of tying back to the university conversation earlier. Well, I mean, if you're contemplating university, why not be f- just for a year at least before you go? If if you're thinking of going in that direction anyway, why not offer yourself for free for uh, give yourself three months, whatever it is, six months maybe? Why not offer yourself for free um, to to companies to go in as a manual tester? Like uh, very few heads of development, chief technology officer, whatever, whatever, whoever's the hiring manager, very few of them. If you contact fifty, yeah, like if you don't, if you don't get someone that says, "All right, why not come in?" And, and do you know what? When, when you do, they'll probably offer you some money anyway. Um, yeah, exactly. that's the reality. Like most people aren't so tight that they wouldn't want to at least give you like <laughs> enough to live off. Um, and like at least you know, th- then you get a taste for it. And at the end of it, if you still really want to have a degree, you can go off and do it. But maybe you keep your your hand in in that business. And um, yeah, I mean that that that's what I think. Yeah, and that's a good way to do it. And if you still want to go to university, then one way you can avoid taking out a load of debt is uh, via the maintenance loan is working part time. And it can work really well. Like I've been helping a guy recently who's in his final year of his comp sci degree, and he's been working like 15, 20 hours a week as a web developer for a company. And uh, he, that way he doesn't have to take out a maintenance loan and they've, they've offered him a grad job. So that's sorted for him. So he can just uh, sit back and focus on his actual coursework. Uh, so that's such a good way of doing it. Like um, I would say to people, like if you do want to go to university, like my biggest regret from university is not the fact that I went, it's the fact that I didn't do a placement year. Um, that was the biggest thing I regret. It's, that is such a good strategy. And if you, if you are already in university and thinking of dropping out, maybe consider just doing a placement year instead. Uh, and that way you it won't be a complete sunk cost. Um, but that's a really good way of doing it. I, I, I think. 100%. Um, I mean, <laughs> Because I, I think, you know, it's important to remember, most people who have gone to university, uh, this evolves as, as they get through the years, but very, very, very few of them really know what they're doing there or why they're there or what they're planning to do at the end of it. Very few, if they're honest, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I had I, I had no idea. Like, the only reason why I ever found out what coding was was because... Uh you know, a computer made me and my flatmate flatmates in our in our halls, um, you know, in first year and he did computer science. Um and then they needed an extra player on their football team. So I went and played with the comp side football team. So then I found out what coding was um via that way. Um there's no way I would have found it otherwise, you know. I did business, so I probably would have ended up, you know, doing sales of some description. Had a vague idea I wanted to be an investment banker, but like really I just want to make a load of money. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I could say like I don't think any of us in that um in that house in uh, when we were nineteen just playing FIFA all day. I don't think many of us were thinking about what we wanted to do in the future, really. No, you, um, you just want to be able to afford to have like nice white trainers for a change and maybe have a car and you know, not be counting your, your pounds when you're buying a pint for the pub. And that, that, that's the extent of most people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it's a good feeling when you're no longer... Um, optimizing your alcohol purchases for, uh, for, for cost uh, for cost per li- uh, milliliter. It took me a long time to get out of that habit after leaving university. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like buying buying a bottle of wine that costs more than a tenner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it feels wrong, uh, but but right. It's nice to be able to like spring for a premium beer and be like, you know what, I'm actually going to really enjoy this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so so you're you're working on a very exciting project at the moment. Um, tech Techers, do you want to tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so. It is a program for anyone. It offers a program for anyone interested in a technology career. 
we channel people kind of to, to two main um, uh, job options, let's say. One is as a tester, QA, and the other is as a web developer. Now, regardless of which one you end up on, and in many cases, we no, none of us really know at the beginning what you're going to end up doing. We, we kind of keep both options open. And the real reason there is either through ability or through just not liking it, not everyone's going to want to be a web developer once they get a taste for this. But regardless of which one you're going for, um, you go through the same process up to a certain point. So we, we look at um, we look at what teams look, and we kind of do a bit of theory as well. So um, we look at what the team structures look like. We look at how things like Atlassian, so how projects are managed, the way you get your tickets through. Um, we have a bit of a look at Scrum. We also uh, give you a kind of a, a playbook as to how to actually build out a ton of connections on LinkedIn. Um, because we leverage that then later on to actually help you get a job. Um, so you go through all these things, bit of theory, and then we get onto the, the uh, we start looking at tools. So we look at um, browser stack, we look at Postman, stuff like that. And after that, then we do, um, we've got, there's a HTML, CSS, and JavaScript um, foundations element of the course. And after that, then we kind of figure out, okay, are you really going to be a web developer or maybe the QA thing is better? And where it's QA, we we kind of just delve further into um, into into what what it involves. We kind of get exercises, and one of the things I'm able to do with some of the QAs is because I run some web dev projects anyway. I actually get them to come on to some of the projects I'm doing, and they can test on these projects. So even before the end of it, they've actually got some real experience. Um, with the developers, we kind of tailor it a little bit to their needs. So. What I, what I kind of recommend all the time is once we get past the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript foundations, that we then build a website using, uh, we, we get them to find a website they like, uh, they like the look of, we get them to rebuild it themselves, but repurpose it as a sort of an online CV. And then we go through uh, React, usually React. There's been two people who've done Vue, but uh, I try and steer people towards React. Um, and we try and get, get we, there's a, ch set of tutorials that we go through on the React side. Once they've got through those, we go back to that website, rebuild it again in React, and we do a couple of little apps, like basically like a to-do list and stuff like that. Um, they should be linked to on, on all of that gets set up in GitHub, and um, by the end of it, uh, there's a few other elements to it, but by the end of it, if you don't have a job, we give you your money back. Very nice. Well, that that that, that kind of uh, yeah, there's your guarantee there, really, isn't it? And that that sounds really comprehensive. That's really cool, and a very uh, I think that's a very innovative way of approaching it. How you go about the methodologies first, and then we go into the actual technical stuff. How, how long is the actual process then? So I, it's a mix. So I've got um, people have done it in three months is fastest. Um, I had a guy. Um, he he was. Uh, Basically, he had a job where he was on, uh, th three weeks on, one week off, or something like that. So he was spending his week off doing this. He took about eight months, I think. Um, so it's kind of a mix. Most people who are coming to me, I, I sort of expected it to be kind of people coming out of, let's say, sixth form, A-levels, um, who wanted to try something before we went to uni or maybe just didn't want to go. As it's transpired, it's, um, it's more people who are sort of 10 years on, let's say, in their careers and they just want something flexible. Obviously, the guarantee that comes with it gives them a lot of confidence. I, I always say this to people, like your, your best case scenario, your worst case scenario with, with this program is you develop 300 odd connections on LinkedIn of in industry relevant people. You learn what it's like to work in a web development team. You have a good chance of getting some work experience just through me. Um, as you're doing it, you learn web development, you build a website that proves you know web development, uh, and you, the worst case is you get your money back. The best case is you get all of that and what it costs you your first month's salary, more or less. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, look, I think it's pretty good. And, and um, because of how it's set up, like that, you know, we were talking about Volley earlier, that app. Mm. So, everyone has access to me on Volley. So, I'm having these conversations. Basically, you can, it's like WhatsApp voice messages, but with video. So, but whenever, because everyone's doing it at different times of the day, so it's not really practical to be arranging Zoom calls with everyone all the time because no, no one's available at normal hours. But if you know, if I'm watching TV at eleven o'clock at night and I get a message, it's very easy for me to go back to someone and just give like a relatively thoughtful response. Um, 
So yeah, that, that's how it works. Very nice. And if people want to get in touch with you to find out more, what, what's the best way? So the best, the best way is if you go to the Tech Herds website. So T-E-C-H-E-R-D-S.com. And there's a link on there. Um, it, it's a very basic website, but there's a link on there which takes you to um, a page that overviews the course. And uh, you can book a free consultation off the back of it. Cool. And uh, that link will be in the description. And uh, what my, my final um, question for you as well, um, I mean, I'll also ask you off air, how, how do you uh, beat the TikTok algorithm? Um, but uh, <laughs> my, my main one was, um, what, would you, uh, what would you change about your career? Like what major lessons have you learned um, being in software engineering for the time you have? I think, uh, I, I think the worst thing you can do in, in software is stay in a company too long. Whether it's website, software, whatever, I, like the problem, the problem with it is what what will happen if you if you go into a business and you, this will usually happen sort of two, three, maybe four years into your career where you're starting to get decent enough at your job, you'll go into a business where you're good enough to make an impact, and then you start building up a relationship with senior management, and you become this sort of all round useful person, and the temptation can arise there because you've got a bit of authority. You, you feel respected. It's quite a nice environment. The temptation can arise to just stay there a long time. And the problem the problem that can arise out of that, uh, and I've sort of fallen into this trap a few times but got out of it, but the problem that can arise out of that is you end up kind of not having a proper senior title, a senior position, but you're a bit hands-off on the code. So you're not you're also not developing yourself on the, on the development side. So you're going to have a bit of a, you're going to have a bit of a punch in the stomach when you try and get back into like a regular dev job. And you're sort of sitting in this limbo land of between uh, like senior dev or mid senior dev and, and manager, but you're neither because you're spending all this time. So uh, a bit of a long way around of saying it, but why, why would, I would encourage people to be whatever role they're in, make sure it's very defined and it's a very easy role to explain to someone else. Um, and, and that's sort of, puts a bit of pressure on if you're a manager or the CTO or whatever, whatever's there, it's kind of giving you a lot of responsibility, but you don't really have the title that comes with it. Senior people will always say the title doesn't matter, but that, that's just because I, I would argue that's just because they don't want the hassle of going through HR and making a promotion. I don't really think it's true. They've got a good title. Like they, they obviously care about it a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I do agree with that. Yeah. There is a lot of the whole. Uh, my favorite is there's a guy on LinkedIn. I'm not trying to throw shade, yeah. um, but there's a guy on LinkedIn who's some kind of he's some kind of like really high end like exact like right at the top, and his his LinkedIn headline is a uh, uh, title. Titles don't matter. Yeah. I'm a husband and father. It's like, yeah, of course it doesn't matter to you. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. Already, you're already a CEO. Yeah, right. It makes a big difference if you're looking for your next job. I guarantee that. Um, so yeah. Like, you know, um, I, so I said, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of being a bit long winded. But I guess my point is don't don't stay in a place too long, especially until you get quite senior. And make sure if you're, if you're doing a job that's sort of looking a bit senior, you know, whether or not, maybe you have a great relationship with your boss and you don't want to be sort of putting this on them, but at least in your own decision making, be conscious of the fact, how do I sell myself in this position going into my next role? Because what happens if this company doesn't actually give me a promotion that I think I might get in a year or two? It's mm. just something to be mindful of. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that for sure. And um, yeah, always always consider the wider picture when negotiating internal moves or yeah. job titles and etc. And remember, uh, always remember, it's a brutal thing to think about, but you are just a resource to a company at the end of the day, yeah. and that you are free to sell that. You're free to sell your labour at a higher price elsewhere if that's what you want to do. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look, I don't, I don't think uh, you can't look bad on the, you know. It's, that is what a company is. A company, by law, its responsibility is to its shareholders. Like the the CEO is just doing their job in looking after the company's best interest. So it's not it's not like a, a good and a bad thing. It's, but equally, although it's not legislated, but your own responsibility is looking after you, um, and, and you have to put that first. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, I, I think that more or less co sort of covers off uh, most of our questions for you. So um, before I said thanks, before I say thanks for coming on and everything, and obviously thanks for coming on. Um, other than tech herds, was there anything else you wanted to shout out and promote? Um, I guess the TikTok being a big one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like what, what, what I do, my background dev wise was always very magento focused. So 
I mean, I'm kind of leaning in back into that a little bit at the moment. Uh, so I guess all I'd say is if you've got a Magento website that needs a bit of TLC, um, you can go to techherds.com as well. And uh, if you don't have a Magento website and you want to get a career working on Magento websites, you can do uh, do the TechHerds course. Very nice. So, sounds good. And uh, actually, before before we do finish up, yeah. um, can you tell me how do I beat the TikTok algorithm? Because you, you've had some TikToks absolutely bang, uh, and I, I need I need to do I need to get some similar numbers. Do you know what you've got to? Uh, uh, some of the t- some of my TikToks that have done well, it's like it's just embarrassing. I mean, you you do a big thoughtful, uh, a big a really detailed thoughtful video, and it just goes nowhere. So I mean, I think I think it's, I think. Um, it's, do you know what? The few videos where I've actually, I'm not that I really know an awful lot about copywriting, but where I've applied copywriting principles to what I've been saying and actually scripted it out, that that that's what works. If you look, if you're by, if you're in Mark Suspenses or your whatever shop, and you look at the magazines on the counter, you know the big glossy magazines with these amazing, um, this ten shocking truths about yeah. Brangelina or whatever, like. That's how that's how you beat the TikTok algorithm. Yeah, uh, I I can imagine that, especially when you have got a split second to catch Gen Z's attention. Yeah, um, that's that's how you do it. Um, I was gonna I was gonna ask if you have you um sunk to the level where you've done a dance yet? Because I've considered it a few times to try and get those <laughs> likes. <laughs> Actually, there is one video I, I put. Uh, I purposely had you know one of the um, the effects you can put over your face. I, yeah. I didn't think, but you know what, mate? I, I've every video I've done where I've tried to do one of the trends, they've all done terrible. Might, oh, might really? Might be because I'm just unimaginative or whatever. I, like I'm not very good at it. But um, I, I do find sticking to my, st- I stick to my trade, uh, talk about my thing. Uh, I think overall it's an under it because this is the other thing. All right, you do some video that picks up on some trend, you could go massive. That's true. But if you've got a very niche service that you're catering to anyway, it doesn't add a lot of value. Mm. You know, if you have a sh- if you if you have a shop, perhaps an online shop, and you sell you sell something that in theory anyone could buy, yeah, th- then it's amazing. But I mean, not everyone wants to be a web developer, so um, it, you know, wh- whatever's yeah. going on, um, I'm not. I, I think for this particular niche, what you and I do, I don't think it's as important. I, I I've seen some of your videos and like. Yeah, I think um, I think the content you go into and the details you go into, I think I if I was you, I would just keep doing that, reiterate on some of them, but work on scripting out and try and copyright it almost. Um, yeah, that, that, that's not to to kind of um, to rehash something that might not be valuable. It's just if if there's a valuable message there, put it in a way that the algorithm picks up on and it encourages people to see. Mm, yeah, I don't think I always think enough before i record one i'm like right i've got a little idea uh, it's going to be about should you go to university in 2022 yeah. bang make the tiktok um my hands are shaking there was one where um i just come in from tesco yeah. and i would be wearing a mask because obviously we still have to wear masks in the shops up here yeah. um my glasses have fogged up uh, had completely fogged up and um i didn't even think about it I did the tiktok and it unexpectedly did really well got like a hundred thousand views nice got about 20 comments saying like what the hell is wrong with your glasses? Like, clean your glasses. It's giving me a headache. <laughs> Maybe that's the winning formula. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll just yeah. get my glasses really fogged up and that's the way forward. <laughs> now, the best one I did on university, the one I did on universities that went best, I, I think it started off with something like, this is why university is a criminal enterprise. Uh, it's something shocking. Oh, that, I saw that video of yours. I was like, ah, that's, that's a way to hook people in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, something, something that you'd see in the sun or the star, papers yeah uh, that, that's what you want <laughs> yeah i mean they're very controversial but there's a reason why they sell so many papers right <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well um yeah thanks again so much for coming on it was really great to learn uh learn so much from you and uh, um uh, as you already mentioned obviously you, you mentioned uh, the techers website if people want to get in touch with you direct is uh, is linkedin best if they want to get hold of that volley address or anything yeah linkedin's fantastic um i i accept everyone on LinkedIn. Perfect. Cool. Well, thanks again for coming on. And uh, thank you as well, listeners, for tuning in to another week of The Code of Career. Hope you enjoyed it. And please do feel free to join our Discord. Uh, But until then, have a great week and happy coding. Thank you.